So what is the sublime? The sublime is a particularly paradoxical concept in literature. Although it is about the use of language, it's more often a feature of what is not said than what is. According to the OED, the word sublime, in reference to a literary work, refers to that which expresses noble ideas in a grand and elevated manner. More generally, it designates the highest sphere of thought, thought, existence or human activity, intellectually or spiritually elevated, or something which is set or raised aloft, very high or exalted. This may sound simple enough, either something which is itself higher exalted or something which speaks of these noble things nobly, right? Well, although this is true, it's a bit more complex than this. We can examine the word sublime a bit more closely by looking at its constituent parts. The part sub is easy enough, as its sense has been preserved in a lot of modern words. Like a subway, it is that which is under or beneath. Sub can also have the sense of being up to or nearly something, just like a substitute teacher is nearly as good as your own. Lime is a bit more difficult and unrelated to the citrus fruit. Lyman was originally a threshold or a boundary. A close modern word is limit. So together, sub plus lime, something under, beneath or nearly at a threshold. How on earth do these two parts add up to the idea of something elevated or something expressed nobly? Well, if you bear them both in mind, this is where the word sublime becomes particularly complex and particularly interesting. For Edmund Burke, who published a treatise about the sublime in 1757, whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible, or is conversant about terrible objects, or operates in a manner analogous to terror, is a source of the sublime, that is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. Burke believed things which cause pain and danger provoke the strongest of all human reactions because they are based on the human need for self-preservation. Things which are based on such self-preservation prompt the most extreme of responses. The impulse to run away from an angry lion or cling on to the edge of a cliff, for instance. However, Burke believed that we can have an idea of these emotions without experiencing their cause directly ourselves. When we have an idea of pain and danger without actually experiencing their causes, he believes we feel an astonishment and terror. Whatever is caused this astonishment and terror for Burke is something which is sublime. So, for instance, if we are literally clinging to the side of a cliff for dear life, we experience first-hand terror. In contrast, if we read an article about someone else clinging to the side of a cliff for dear life, and we are faced with, through their account, so at second hand, the ideas of pain and terror, the article is a source of the sublime. If we are literally faced by a tiger, then we experience danger. If we read about someone facing a tiger, we experience the idea of danger. This notion of a second hand idea of an extreme emotion is most associated with the first and second definitions in the OED. It engages intellectually with ideas or thought rather than direct experience. At the same time though, something sublime can also be a thing itself, something set or raised aloft, very high or exalted. I'd like to argue that in Ozymandias we need to remember both of these senses, the notion of the sublime as an intense second-hand experience and as a high elevated thing in itself. But importantly, we also need to remember the parts of the etymological sum we saw earlier, particularly sub, something which is under, almost, or nearly. I'd suggest that Shelley's poem is both expressing the experience of something which is a second-hand emotion, and hence under, but nearly the realisation of this emotion, but also something which can nearly, but not quite, be expressed. There is grandeur, but it cannot be fully expressed in words. This is what I meant when I said at the start that the sublime is paradoxical. It relies as much on what cannot be said as what can. It strives to express, but ultimately cannot master nor control that which is lofty and uncontrollable.
And I think that Shelley's choice to use an imported voice for the majority of the poem, his poem claims to be quoting for the vast majority of the time, a traveller from an antique land, yet to still begin with the first person, I, Matt, perfectly communicates this paradox. It's clearly a very affecting, moving scene, which has impacted the poem's speaker on a personal level, and which is presented to its reader on this personal level, inviting a personal response. But yet the content expressed is not fully owned, it's someone else's, and it's not able to fully be mastered because of this. There's an intensity, but also an eeriness, a distance, which this detachment causes. It's both incomplete and incompletable. We can nearly reach its context, nearly grasp its meaning, but not quite. There's a great irony too in Shelley's use of the highly structured sonnet form to convey such open-endedness. Perhaps that's why the poem sticks with us so much. It's unfinished business, even when its sonnet structure in the closing of its quotation signals that it's done. This is where the sense of sub as being under or reaching towards something else becomes important. We are presented with mere fragments, which do not claim to convey the entire history of Ozymandias and his empire, not even in miniature. Rather, Shelley shows us just enough to show us what we cannot know. But what about the second sense of the sublime? What is the lofty, elevated topic of Ozymandias? Clearly not the titular figure, uh, best known as Ramesses nowadays. He's been reduced to mere trunkless legs and a shattered visage. No, I'd suggest that in a manner typical of the close but not quite nature of the sublime, the really sublime element of the poem has not been named at all and hence is very open to interpretations. It's probably useful for exam purposes, as well as for your own interest, to think about a few of these alternatives. At least for me, the sublime element, that which causes fear and terror in us, is the stark confrontation with the process of time. We are shown a rapid process of decay compressed into one short space, as the image of Ozymandias' passions and his sculptures' actions summon a vivid but all too brief picture of a society which, as we are very promptly reminded, is now nothing beside remains. No hope of redemption at all left. The idea of infinity, which is closely related to inexpressibility, as it's impossible to talk in any definite terms about something endless, was also identified by Burke as a source of the sublime. He argued that infinity has a tendency to fill the mind with that sort of delightful horror, which is the most genuine effect and truest test of the sublime. Perhaps the delightful horror of Shelley's poem, then, is the confrontation it gives us as readers with the infinity of time and the brevity of our, as well as Ozymandias's, meaningful existence. It also, though, implies, through both structure and language, that we can never comprehend this infinity. Just as Ozymandias' statue and kingdom is fragmentary, so is our understanding of his history, and, by implication, of our own. And I think here we can end with the second part of the etymological equation. How does Shelley's poem relate to the notion of Lyman, a threshold or boundary? Does Shelley's poem convey a sense of being on the edge of something? I believe so, but perhaps it is best understood as being on the edge of, between, two things. The past, the history which yet survives, read through the statue of Ozymandias, and the future, the stretching lone and level sands. For me, the poem is sublime in both its topic, the human position, history, time and the universe, and in the way that it is treated this topic. It shows us up to the threshold of what we can feel, up to the threshold of what we can comprehend, and lets us stare in terror at what we can't.